The reading is from 2 Peter, um, page 1222, using the Bibles on the seat. It's 2 Peter, chapter 1, um, verses 1 um, to 11. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word. It is by your word that you have granted us knowledge um, of you through the power of your spirit so that we can know you and love you and serve you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will increase our knowledge this evening as your word is proclaimed and that, Lord, that that knowledge will change us, shape us, be seen in our lives the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. <clears throat> do turn to, to Peter. Have your Bibles in um, front of you. This is the Word of God that we'll be looking at together. You have a handout there if you find that uh, useful for you to aid your listening and to reflect on with the questions later. Now, I don't know whether many of you will um, know this guy, Arthur F. Um, Burns. He was um, chairman um, of the United States Federal Reserve, and he was also a former um, U.S. ambassador to West Germany. He was also economic um, counselor to numerous presidents, ranging from Eisenhower um, to Reagan. But he was also Jewish, so when he began attending an informal prayer meeting for, um, for prayer and fellowship at the White House, um, people um, accorded him, it was in the 1970s, with special respect. But no one quite knew what to do with him or how to um, involve him. So each week they took turns to lead sections, but they passed by him out of respect and a little bit of uh, reticence. However, one day, um, the group was being led by a newcomer who wasn't aware of the unusual status um, that Burns occupied. So at the end of the meeting, the newcomer um, turned to Burns and asked him if he would um, close in prayer. And without missing a beat, Burns reached out, held the hands of the others in the circle, and then he prayed this prayer. Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. Finally, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians 
to know Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, he wasn't actually attempting to be clever. Um, he was simply underscoring a point that many people often make and that he'd observed, that it's only too possible to claim to know Christ, to have knowledge of Christ, without exhibiting that knowledge in your life. You see, knowledge is a big theme in 2 Peter that we're going to be studying over the next several weeks. It runs throughout the book. The book opens with the theme of knowledge. Look at verse 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then flick on to chapter 3, verse 18, <clears throat> where the book closes with, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So, according to 2 Peter, 2 Peter has his bookends of knowledge. It's going to be about um, knowledge. And knowledge plays a significant part um, in the Christian life. And for Peter, when we think about biblical um, knowledge, people use the word knowledge in all sorts of ways. But for Peter, when he talks about knowledge, knowledge of God, it is something that is received <clears throat> through the mind accepted and believed in the heart, and then it, it permeates through the whole of one's life. For Peter, that's biblical knowledge. So when he talks about knowledge, it's this knowledge that through the mind, accepted and believed in the heart, and then permeates through the whole of life. And so that's why he begins in verses 1 to 4 with the importance of a knowledge of Jesus. Verse 3 is um, key in understanding this whole section. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. So Peter is saying, look, God, through his inexhaustible store, our all-powerful God has fully equipped us to make and keep us in the faith, to make faith, to create faith within us and to keep us in that faith. And it is all tied to a knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Savior. Now, this is absolutely um, so necessary to say and to press home at this uh, point. Because we're living in a time when many people want to downplay uh, the importance of knowledge um, in the Christian life. So some people will espouse, and you hear it all the time, that what you know about God, you know, knowledge, it's just dry. What you really want is not knowledge, but you need to experience God. It's the experience of God that counts, not a knowledge of God. But Peter is very clear throughout his letter that to experience God in a true and full way will only ever come about if you have a true and full knowledge of God as revealed by him. It's knowledge that embarks us on our journey of faith with Jesus Christ. Just look at verse 1. Isn't it interesting? It's through our knowledge of Christ that we have received a faith as precious of that as the apostles. If you want to experience God, and surely we believe that the apostles experienced God with the faith that they have, and Peter says that came through knowledge. Or, um, look on at verse 2, grace and peace. Now, there are words of relationship and experiencing relationship with God. Grace and peace are ours in abundance. How? Through knowledge of God. You see, if you try to <coughs> separate our experience um, of God from our knowledge of God, that's like trying to separate my experience of my family from the knowledge of my family. It would be absolutely, utterly ridiculous to say that I can have experience of my family outside of a knowledge of them. See, in any real relationship, experience of anyone flows from our knowledge of that person. Now, this is so important because... If you start to build any kind of relationship, you don't want to experience a relationship with someone, and you try to build that 
on faulty knowledge, half sort of baked knowledge, then you soon realize that that relationship will sure to be a sham and eventually it will break down. You need to have true and full knowledge. And those who remove knowledge of God as revealed in the Bible and say, no, what it is, is it's how you experience God in some kind of subjective sense, actually ruin people's chances of ever having a real relationship with God and experiencing Him in a full way. Not only has God given us His divine um, power, in, in His divine power, given us everything that we need uh, for a life of godliness, but it also says that He's given us His very great and precious promises. And through these promises, we participate in the divine nature and escape the um, corruption uh, in the world caused by our evil desires. So what is it to participate in the divine nature? Well, in one respect, it's to become more like um, Jesus um, Christ, the one we follow. What does it mean to participate in the divine nature? It's to share in the glory that is going to be uh, revealed with the return of Christ. You see, it's only in a knowledge of Jesus Christ that one can move from death to life. It's only in a knowledge of Jesus Christ that our futures are secure. It's only in a knowledge of Jesus Christ that rescues us from the dominion of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of light. And so you have to be on your guard. Or if you have faulty thinking in this area, you now have to change it. You've got to be on your guard against when you hear anyone who seeks to separate godliness from a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Savior and purely try to tie you to experience. Why? Because if they do that, they'll rob you of participating in the divine nature. You have to be very careful of those who make promises divorced from a knowledge of God. You see, those people who make those promises, whatever promises they might be, but if they're not promises rooted in a knowledge of God that's come from God by virtue of the Scriptures, then all those people will do is abandon you um, to the corruption um, of the world. There's a phrase, isn't there, that people use, that people say, knowledge is um, power. And Peter actually would agree, knowledge is power, because it's through a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord that we can participate in the divine nature. What greater power is there? And we can escape the corruption in the world caused by our evil desires. So this knowledge of God and Jesus our Savior that embarks us on our journey also empowers us for the journey. Verses 5 to 9, Peter wants to stress the importance of a knowledge of Jesus lived out. Let's look at verse 5. It says, make every effort. Then in verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's with this conscious knowledge um, of all that Jesus has done that we then make every uh, effort. Christians are not people who just seek to coast along in the Christian life, but actively pursue um, living out the knowledge that they have. Let me just say that again, because it's one of those lines that we just hear, I wrote myself, and don't think too much about it. Christians don't coast along according to 2 Peter. They actively pursue living out the knowledge that they have. Now, do you know the problem? We all ought to be squirming at this point. It's one of those lines that I could just say it and we could just let it wash over us. It doesn't seem as cutting as other lines that are said, but in actual fact, most of us are cursed, aren't we? Cursed along in the Christian life. No actively pursuing it. We'll actively pursue many, many other things but not a knowledge of God, and that knowledge lived um, out. 
Think about it like this. Imagine a, a medical student. Um, we've got one, at least one, and there might be more. Spends um, several rigorous years of study <clears throat> and training. And at the end of their training, fully qualified, you ask them, what are you going to do <clears throat> with all this knowledge? What are you going to do with all this experience that you've acquired over the last several years of diligent study? And they tell you this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to beat all my friends at operation. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lick the lot of them. Now, don't knock it. I loved Operation um, growing up. But I can tell you one thing. You only need one bit of knowledge to play Operation. Don't touch the side with the metal pincers. Otherwise, the buzzer's going to go off. That medical student are not living out the knowledge that they've been given. They've demeaned it. They've made it a sham. It's a laughing stock. Several years um, wasted of their life. And so it is with every Christian who just simply plays a game with the knowledge of God that they have, who plays a game with the sermons that they hear, the Bible studies that they go to, their own personal quiet times. Knowledge is meant to be lived out. That's what it says in verses 5 to 9. It's meant to change you. In fact, it says we're to make every effort, working hard at our Christian lives, striving after the pursuit of godliness. If you're moving heavy things or you're doing some um, gardening, sometimes you just have to um, grit your teeth and um, drive um, forward. Uh, my neighbor John told me that he was laughing because I was in the garden with my children and they wanted to pack in after a certain amount of time. And I said, just got to push through it, push through it. Push through it. Keep going. Get it, get it done. Oh, my legs are hurting. My back is hurting. So are mine. So are mine. Are they 30 years older than you, my legs, and you're my back? Just keep going. And that's what Peter is saying. He says, look, you've got to make every effort. This is what Jesus is calling us to. In the pursuit of godliness, in the pursuit of the holy life, in the pursuit of living this knowledge out that we get, sometimes you've just got to grit your teeth, grin and bear it, and push forward knowing that you have everything you need because of God's divine power. Remember last week, that power available to us, that same power according to Ephesians, that were exerted in raising Christ from the dead. So what is the proof that God is working in you? What is the proof that God is working in you? Well, partly it's that you have been set to work for God. Peter puts it like this. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. God's power has saved you, and through God's power, he's going to sanctify you. He's going to make you more like Jesus Christ, more like him. Now, we all know that it's unrealistic to expect that a knowledge of what a healthy diet and a good exercise plan looks like is going to get you fit and healthy. I wish it could, because I'm very good at getting my head around things. I can grasp things like that. I could take in all these health plans. I could take in all these things that the physical and personal trainers say at the gym. But if there's no self-control, if there's no self-discipline, if I don't put myself to eat the things that we're told to eat and resist and, restrain and refrain from eating the things I ought not to eat, if I'm not disciplined enough to get to the gym or to put in the lens at the pool or to go on the walks, then nothing's going to change. And if we as Christians, if we think that we're not making the progress and that we ought to or should, let me tell you something. It's not because God hasn't given you what you need. It's because you're not making the effort. Simple as that. There's no lack on God's part. Only ever a lack on our part. Peter highlights, doesn't he? Just look at some of the things he asked because it's really important. He says, 
self-controlled and perseverance, he highlights those two things. These are words of discipline, the power to resist self-indulgence on the one hand, the uh, power to uh, resist opposition on the other hand. As Christians, we're not supposed to be couch potatoes, that we're more described like crack commandos, warring against our sinful nature, warring against the ways of the world, instead of being sofa fodder. And then he also mentions <clears throat> godliness. We'll make every effort to live out uh, a different life in the world, exhibiting the values and virtues and attitudes which are fast disappearing from post-Christian society. Some of them so simple like courtesy, restraint, kindness, and purity, thoughtful and consideration, but pursuing that godly life. And then he, he ends the uh, lists with mutual affection and love. Uh, within the Christian community, we're to make every um, effort um, to have a level of affection for each other that would make non-Christians sit up and think, wow, what is it about these people? They truly do uh, love each other. They're fond of each other, and it's shown in their speech and in their actions. And then notice in verse 8, it isn't that the people Peter is writing to doesn't, don't have these qualities, but he says he wants them to add to them. We're to have them in increasing uh, measure. And the motivation is um, huge to have these in increasing measure because it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. Now, I would say that maybe in Peter's day, maybe more so in generations past, to say to somebody, oh, you don't want to be ineffective and unproductive, most people would have said, you're right. That's the last thing I want to be, ineffective and unproductive. Unfortunately, in our day and age, it's almost like a prize, being ineffective and unproductive. And so we're going to have to change our attitude. These are some of the things that are going to have to renew our mind by the power of the Spirit. When my children's report cards come um, home, um, they come back from school and they have two things on them. I won't hold it up so you can't see too much. It wouldn't be fair to them. Um, but you, you have attainment and effort. I will just say for all my children, that the attainment is like they have at age expectation, above age expectation, below age expectation. And my children, they, they, you know, they're always flying in attainment. But then they have this category called effort. And you get a one, two, or a three, very good, good, satisfactory, below average. Let me ask you a question. If you were a parent, and if your child came over with a report card, and on the attainment, everyone was A, 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 all the way down, above expectation, at everything. And then the effort was just satisfactory. What would you think? Taking them to McDonald's and off to Smith's for them to buy whatever they want? Or do we really think effort matters? Peter, in this section, is like a loving parent, and he, he just says, look, you're doing well, but you're going to have to pull your socks up. <laughs> you need a little bit more effort if you're going to make progress in these um, areas. He's basically saying, to him, look, you've, you've received such a treasure of knowledge. Don't waste it. Uh, maximize it. Make every effort. Indeed, he, in verse 9, he says, if you're not investing in Christian growth, all it reveals is that you're short-sighted, blind, having forgotten that what you've been saved from in the first place, your past sins. It says if you're not pursuing, if you're not making every effort to take this knowledge and live it out so that these virtues and these characteristics are growing within you, then you've really lost sight of any real knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if you forsake knowledge of Jesus Christ, then you forsake Christ himself. That's how um, serious it is. So let me draw it to, let's wrap up. So it's a knowledge of <clears throat> Jesus that embarks us on our journey. It's a knowledge of him that empowers us for that journey. 
And it's a knowledge of where we're heading that encourages us on in the journey. That's where he ends in verses 10 and 11. The importance of the knowledge of Jesus lived out in the light of his eternal kingdom. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. It's with this conscious living out of the Christian life that we gain assurance. Now, it's a, um, well, I could give you a little history about um, Christian assurance. It's very interesting. I, I think we're probably in a day in our church is probably closer to the idea that we preach the gospel, you're, sal- you're saved by faith in Christ um, alone, through Christ, through faith in Him alone. That's how we're saved. And as a result, most of us become coasters. And because all the wealth of the Bible teaching about assurance that comes through living out this knowledge is somehow lost in us because we think it's Roman Catholicism. We ditched that with the Reformation, didn't we? And so the, within the Christian church, particularly in the West, the whole idea of making every effort doesn't seem to be a big um, thing. It's such a sad thing when so many Christians are not living with the full assurance um, that Peter speaks about. See, if we live out this knowledge uh, of Jesus um, Christ, it stops us uh, from falling, and then we can have increased confidence that we'll progress and that we'll make it um, to the end. That's not saying that we'll never um, stumble in the ways of sin, but we'll never fall by the wayside, never to get up and regain our footing. And so if we're making progress by living out the knowledge, we gain an assurance that we'll continue to make progress. Let me put it to you like this. You know when you're on the motorway and all the lanes are clear and you're flying down and there's no other cars, you think, we'll be in London in three hours. Yeah? We'll be in London in three hours. Because you know that's how long the journey takes and you know that you can get there. But when the obstacles come in the way, when the cars start to pile up, you lose assurance about whether you're going to get there in time. And the Christians that are hindering themselves by sin and not making every effort to live out the knowledge of God that has been given to them start to lack assurance about whether they'll make it in the end. We also gain assurance because we know that if we practice these things in ever-increasing measure, then we will receive a rich welcome into his eternal kingdom. That's what verse 11 says. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rather than falling by the wayside, we'll be welcomed into heaven with open arms. And so the positive of this rich welcome and the negative of um, fall work together as a great motivation so that we make every effort to pursue godliness. So could I just ask, is this a word for you this evening? That one reason may be that you're not sure about your salvation or that you're riddled with um, doubts about where your life is going, is heaven um, real, and that your relationship with God seems to falter and doesn't seem rich or deep. Could I just ask that are you making the effort? Are you making every effort? Maybe you're coasting. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe you've become a Christian couch potato. Well, Peter says, my dear friends, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have richly um, blessed us. You've richly blessed us being part of this congregation, Lord, because um, knowledge of you is held forth regularly, um, openly, truthfully. 
And we ask, Lord, that you, through your Spirit, strengthen us. Lord, we feel so weak. We ask that you will strengthen feeble um, knees, weak um, legs. You'll strengthen us with the power of your Spirit so that we can make every effort. Lord, we, many of us are physically tired, emotionally um, tired, mentally strained. And it seems too much the effort and before us to live out the knowledge of you it seems burdensome. But we trust in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who spoke and said uh, that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Help us knowing these things and through your power that works within us to make every uh, effort uh, to live out the knowledge that you have revealed to us. We ask this uh, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.